Creator and the one who's coming we anticipate in the Advent season. Probably the most fun of our American Christmas traditions for me is the exchange of gifts, particularly those that are surprise gifts. And I don't mean those surprises your parents give you on Christmas Eve to whet your appetite. My parents did horrible things on Christmas Eve. They go, come on kids, you want to open a present before you go to bed? And we being kids and gullible and easily taken in, rush out, oh yeah, 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 presents, presents, presents. And they'd hand us each a box and box didn't have much heft to it. And we'd open it and every year they took us in. Pajamas. <laughs> now put them on and go to bed. And one of the really hard parts of adulting, especially when you're the one responsible for maintaining a very tight budget, is that it makes it next to impossible for someone in the household to buy a gift that will be a surprise. Melinda, because she doesn't drive, real, really has problems in this area because imposed by her conditions. Somebody has to take her. Somebody, she has to have money to do it with, that I can't track. <laughs> she ends up squirreling away money here and there, off and on, to have money to buy me a surprise. And I'm not really particular about what the surprise is, as long as it's a surprise and it's not pajamas. <laughs> I guess for starters, it's necessary to define joy. The term is a lot broader than happiness or ecstasy. Lillian Daniel defined it in a devotional piece. Happiness is a feeling brought on by inner and outer circumstances. But joy speaks to more than feelings or circumstances. Joy is the intersection of deep pleasure and deep meaning. Joy can occur even in unhappy situations, such as in the midst of a sacrifice. Joy springs up in that odd moment when despair turns madly, unexpectedly, against all odds, towards hope. The theologian Jürgen Moltmann said, in pain, we want our suffering to disappear. In joy, we want the things that make us happy to endure. Joy is big and generous. Pain is short-sighted and in the scheme of eternity, short-lived. I think we can all appreciate the skepticism of the disciples of John the Baptist when they met up with Jesus face to face. The book of Acts tells us the Jewish nation that was under the boot of Roman Empire had seen would-be messiahs come and go over the last century or so, and it never seemed to end well. So when Jesus came along and made these claims, and people saw him doing the miracles that Jesus did, a little skepticism, a little suspicion began to arouse, kind of like Mulder on the old X-Files show. He wanted to believe. But at the same time, the weight of history was against them. Are, were the disciples going to get their hopes up only to have them dashed by another flash in the pan? Put yourself in the shoes of John the Baptist. And I think in these rather troubled times in our country when you've got a incoming administration that's almost doing by design, trying to keep things as chaotic and hassle-filled as humanly possible, we don't know what, where joy is coming from. We don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, John preached Jesus as the one who would bring deliverance. However, John's sitting in prison, and he's fixing to literally lose his head for questioning 
the the legitimacy of the king marrying his the widow of the brother he assassinated. So he needed deliverance right away. And John's question is one that each of us can find ourselves asking at the hard points of life. So we asked with the disciples of John the Baptist, are you, Jesus, really the one we're waiting for? Melinda and I met at a church that started each service with this litany. The pastor would come out and boom, God is good. And the people would apply all the time. And then the pastor would say, all the time. And the people, God is good. I really hated that. There was many a Sunday when that enforced happiness just really rang false. Now, on a level of fact and proposition, God legitimately, really, truly is good all the time. On an emotional level, on a level of the present, it doesn't always, I'm not really feeling that goodness right now, God. Uh, Joy seems worlds away, and we ask Jesus, are you the one? Or do we find our joy somewhere else? Jesus' response calls back to Isaiah. The blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor hear the good news. And this time, it really is good news for the poor and afflicted who find themselves in opposition to the privileged. Now, this Old Testament reading that Jesus quoted in Isaiah 35 was not specifically a prophecy about the Messiah. So here's the surprise. The Messiah, whose coming we anticipate and reenact in the Advent season, will be the one bringing these promises to pass. And in that, we find the joy that surprises us. Jesus then turns to the crowd and says, just what is it you were looking for in John the Baptist? Someone weak who could be knocked over by a strong breeze? No, John may have been bent by the force of empire, but he wasn't broken, even though that force would soon execute him. A person of privilege in fancy robes? Jesus said, you're looking in the wrong place. A prophet? Oh yes, and then some. The last time I stood in this pulpit, I told you about my affection for the sport of professional wrestling. One of the guys I first really started watching was a crazy Canadian named Roddy Piper. And he, he was wild and he was unpredictable and you never knew exactly what was going to come out of his mouth at any given time. But he had a catchphrase. He said, just when you think you've got all the answers, I'm going to change the question. Jesus did that here. And many times through his life on earth, Jesus changed the questions. The scope of the reign of heaven will never be fully apprehended by our finite brains. So there's always some new surprise that God has for us as we try to follow the Spirit's leading. Times when we, we rediscover, as in Isaiah 35, 4, that Wayne just read, here is your God. God will come and save you. The sermon title comes from an autobiography written by the popular author C.S. Lewis, who is probably best known for his children's series, The Chronicles of Narnia. In this autobiography, Surprised by Joy, Lewis chronicled how his early experiences in childhood and adolescence led, it, led him to abandon the Christian faith while in prep school, or our equivalent would be high school, feeling it a chore and a duty. He substituted the religion of his youth with studies in the occult and various mythologies, particularly Norse mythology. What Lewis was really hunting for was an inward joy, a remedy for what he called by the German word Sehnsucht, or a sort of nostalgic longing. While at Oxford, he became a member of a small literary clique known as the Inklings. And among the members of this little group 
kind of the literary rat pack of their day, was George MacDonald and uh, someone you, you might have heard of that wrote a few books called The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien was a very committed, hardcore Catholic. And Tolkien and Lewis would go round and round and round discussing religion. And after debating the case that God even existed with Tolkien, Lewis finally gave in and, ab and abandoned his atheism, taking his initial step back to Christianity. Lewis said, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalen, night after night, feeling, whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. I did not see then what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet. But who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance of escape? The words compelli entrare, compel them to come in, have been so abused by wicked men that we shudder at them. But properly understood, they plumb the depth of the divine mercy. The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. Lewis's reaction to this revelation of God in his life is something that probably never occurred to the biblical authors, but we can appreciate his analogy here. If you want to know how I felt, imagine your own feelings on waking up one morning to find that income tax or unrequited love had somehow vanished from the world. So our aim, as we gradually approach the coming of, of the celebration of Christmas, is to recapture that joy in discovering Jesus again for the very first time. This is the Sunday of joy as we're getting closer and closer. We're, in, we're within the two-week mark. And coming to the, to the Messiah for the first time as a human who shared in our common life. And as we look forward to a time when Jesus will come again, as the creeds say, to judge the living and the dead. Many in the church have overemphasized that thought of judgment way out of proportion. Putting fear in many Christians, they simply will never, ever measure up. Let's reframe that a bit. Let's focus on the Christ who brought God's grace into the world. Let our salvation that comes to that grace be God's best present to us. The biggest coming of the surprises of Jesus is that Jesus will indeed be God with us, not God against us. Each Sunday when Pastor Jim preaches, he usually begins with the blessing, grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. They are free gifts. Let's stop right there. Gifts. Gifts. Gifts from our God to us. And this isn't that new pair of pajamas or a new pair of socks. We might need those things at the time. But in this world, we need grace, mercy, and peace on an inward level. Why don't we unpack those gifts so that they may surprise us with joy again? As we wait for the coming of Christ, let's receive those gifts again and again and again, those surprises of joy, and let's re-gift them to others so that they can share in the joy of God's grace and God's freedom. Shalom and amen.